Hello everybody. I hope you are having a great day today. I want to give you an Ask Anything shorter version today. Uh, I was looking through the inbox at questions that I had that just probably wouldn't be a great fit for a Sunday morning message and thought I want, wanted to go ahead and start uh, working on some of those shorter questions. And so today's question is one that I've kind of seen sitting there in the inbox uh, for a while. It was a very early question and uh, I want to go ahead and, and take care of it today. So that question that we're going to deal with today is comes from a young person in our uh, younger t uh, college demographic, and their question is, is anything about Calvinism true? Is anything about Calvinism true? Okay, so uh, I realize answer this question, there's a lot of people that don't even know what that word means, and there's a lot of people who have preconceived notions about what they believe that word to mean. So let me just be really basic in this video and if you want more info you can come talk to me separately so in an overview I'm gonna do really brief overview uh, to answer the question up front is anything about Calvinism true yes there is a lot true about Calvinism so first of all you need to know Calvinism is not another religion it's not another denomination uh, it is a system of theology and of interpreting passages of Scripture okay so you can be a Calvinist Baptist, or you can be a not Calvinist Baptist, which is called an Arminian Baptist. Those are called free will Baptists, or uh, or you can try to live somewhere in the middle. So there's sort of this scale out there in theology circles where uh, on one side is Arminianism, and on the other side is Calvinism, and then there's a lot of area in between the pure spots on the ends. Uh, but just know we're not talking about denominations or religions or different groups. These are ways of thinking that could apply to any Christian, denominational uh, or not. So it has nothing to do with that. It's named for a reformer in the, in the Reformation era who's sort of second generation named John Calvin. So Martin Luther was first generation. Uh, John Calvin followed him and... Uh, Again, the opposing view to Calvinism was called Arminianism. And I think, I'm pretty sure that in uh, Jacob Arminius and John Calvin's lives, no one was using those terms. Uh, so it's not like th those groups were even developed at that time by those names. Uh, the discussion between Calvinism and Arminianism, uh, at its minimum, at its most minimum, is trying to answer the question, which is more true? Does man seek after God in salvation, or does God seek after man in salvation? Which is more true? Uh, who's pursuing whom? Uh, and you know, most Baptists, again, in the modern era, have tried to affirm a little bit of both is true. That's kind of where most Baptists try to live, is to take each scripture passage as it comes and deal with it and try to hold that there are elements of truth in both and that we don't really know how both of those truths work together, that there is an element where man is uh, seeking after God and trying to uh, reach out in faith to, to seek after God, but also the fact that God must uh, go after and pursue after man. So a lot of Baptists have tried to harmonize those things and live in the middle uh, to sort of give you the, the extremer uh, positions, pure Arminianism, is mostly held by your Methodists, your Pentecostals. They're going to go more toward the Arminian side, whereas the group that completely endorses full-blown Calvinism would be your confessional conservative Presbyterians. So any, any Presbyterian that holds to the Westminster Confession of Faith, uh, they are going to be a five-point Calvinist. No problem with it. That's part of their doctrines. And, um, you know, Baptists really l live all the way in, in between. Free will Baptists are completely Arminians, whereas you have Reformed Baptists who might say, we're a Southern Baptist or, or we're a Baptist, but we also embrace the full five points of Calvinism. And again, that's, that's pretty common to be all over the place. Um, historically, Baptists have been more Calvinistic than Arminian. So if you have uh, to say, all right, since the Reformation to around 1900, uh, Baptists were pretty universally Calvinists, and uh, not until the last hundred years did the pendulum swing back. And so in our modern era, it's more common uh, to have Arminian Baptists, or at least Arminian-leaning, 
or Baptists that really hate that title of Calvinist and they do everything they can uh, not to have that title applied to them. Uh, but in uh, you know ancient times, I guess you could say in the 1800s, not that long ago, uh, there was a, a preacher by the name of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, C.H. Spurgeon, and he is one of the most popular, well-known, most quoted uh, pastors of the of the last uh, century, and uh, he, he is a well-known Calvinist. So I have a, just a little pamphlet here written by uh, C.H. Spurgeon, A Defense of Calvinism. So we love Spurgeon. I mean, every, every Baptist looks up to Spurgeon. He fought liberalism. He was a conservative, and uh, he fought the downgrade uh, heresy going on at the time. And Great guy, full-blown Calvinist. And uh, so I, I just want you to know, it, if, you're, if you have negative thoughts toward Calvinism, you probably shouldn't. Um, at the same time, one of my greatest heroes uh, of the faith of uh, uh, pastors is Adrian Rogers. He was a Southern Baptist Convention president in the 80s, pastored Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee, and was a huge part of the seminary that I attended there. And uh, he was really not comfortable with, with Calvinism. He would often preach that he did not believe it was biblical. Um, he said he was a two-point Calvinist, I believe. And, uh, and and I love Adrian Rogers. I think he's a great, great pastor. I listen to his sermons regularly. So all of that sort of just opening information to say Baptists have always been all over the place on this, and that's okay. Uh, but the question was, is anything true about it? And I said, yes, there is. So let me give you just a couple of brief thoughts that might uh, try to show you, if, if you're skeptical of Calvinism, that might just push you to say, hey, you know, there is a lot of, of truth in it. And uh, you might disagree with the interpretation of the passages that I'm getting ready to read, but I want to at least show you some important passages to Calvinists, okay? So, um, a few things that Calvinism affirms that I do believe to be true, all right? These are sort of just pulled from my mind, all right? First of all, predestination and election, or those are words that, that Calvinists use that a lot of people are uncomfortable with. You need to know those are biblical terms. So, number one, Predestination and election are not made up terms by Calvinists to trick people or to create their theology. Those are very much Bible terms. Um, so if you would, I'm going to show you uh, Ephesians 1, 3 through 6, very strong verses to consider. Uh, so I'll read them for you. Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. All right, so just looking at that passage again, I'm not going to go in depth on these passages, but uh, we have that before the foundation of the world, God the Father chose us to be saved by Christ the Son. Uh, we The choosing was, in verse 5, that he predestined us for adoption. Uh, adoption means salvation in the Bible. When you're adopted into the family of God, you're, you're saved. That's what it means to be saved. So, there is no doubt that it is a biblical way to think, to consider that before creation was ever made, um, God had you on his mind, and he predestined you to adoption as sons, because it says it right there in the verse. So, again, that's a completely biblical way to think, not strange, not weird Presbyterian stuff. Uh, that's, that's a normal Bible passage. Predestination and election are both Bible terms. Number two, um, things we can affirm, is that man is deeply affected by the fall of Adam. Man is deeply affected by the fall of Adam. The reason this is a, a concern is one of the debate points is that um, we are basically, uh, Arminians would say we have complete free will, that we are, our will to choose God is untarnished. It is, um, has not been changed or altered in any way. We can freely choose God or we can freely reject God. Um, the Bible, I, I think, would say that's not completely true. Uh, we all have a will, we all make choices, but that will and those choices are deeply affected by the curse, the fall. So we, are, we have fallen minds, we have fallen wills, we have fallen desires. And so we choose bad things often. And um, what we would say is that 
we our our free choices are free, but they are free to choose what our will dictates that we must choose. So we have a nature that has been corrupted. And so we're, you're, you're freely choosing based upon your corrupted nature. Uh, so you'll notice I, I don't use the term free will as a pastor. You'll, you'll not hear me say that because I don't believe our wills are free. I think our wills are bound to the nature that we have, whether we have a nature uh, that is in Adam or whether we have a nature that is in Christ. Uh, but you're, you're either a slave to Adam and your sin or you're a slave to Christ and righteousness. Uh, but I don't think anybody's free. There's nobody. Only God is free. God is the is the uh, the only free being in the universe. That's what it means to be sovereign. Uh, but just to show you a quick passage, um, Ephesians two one through three, really common, great passage. Paul again writes, and you speaking of uh, speaking of be- uh, unbelievers, so people before they knew Christ. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. And if you're a preacher, you got to keep going, but God, right? All right, but we're not going there. Uh, So... In, in verse 1, it says that you're dead in your trespasses and sins, okay? You, I don't think you, we can say that to be dead in trespasses and sins somehow can mean that you are unaffected by your sin nature. No, dead means dead. You, you are bound to a dead nature that doesn't see Christ as beautiful naturally, doesn't see Christ as, as worth treasuring. Um, and then in verse 3, He says that we were by nature children of wrath. Our very nature was wrath. Um, And so Adam and Eve's curse in the garden affected you and I. We're born sinners. We are born, uh, we are not just uh, sinners because we sin. Um, We sin because we're sinners, right? So both of those things are true. Uh, So I think we can affirm that. I think we can affirm that we were affected by the fall it's not. It didn't mean nothing. It wasn't just a bad example what Adam provided to us. No, there was a curse placed upon mankind that as soon as we are born, we are bent towards sin because that's our nature. All right, so that's number two. Number three, the first mover in our salvation must be the Spirit of God, and our faith then follows that move of the Spirit. So this This is often called regeneration precedes faith. So the reason this is a discussion is that Arminians would say that uh, in salvation, the first moment, what's the first action to take place, to the first domino to fall in our lives um, to get salvation going? Um, An Arminian would say that it's your faith. So you place faith in Christ and then regeneration happens and you believe. Uh, You repent and you believe. Um, Again, this seems like splitting hairs. It's actually not. Calvinists would say, close but not quite, first regeneration happens. So the Spirit of God moves and opens up your, your eyes. He opens up your spiritual eyes to see. All of a sudden, now you can see and then you choose God because you're free now. The Spirit of God has enlivened you. He's made you able to see Christ as beautiful, as worthy of uh, your worship, whereas bef- whereas without the influence of the Spirit, you were bound to your sin nature. You were a child of wrath, uh, dead to sin. So the Spirit of God, by the way, the Spirit of God always works in tandem with the Word of God, with the presentation of the Gospel. So the Gospel is preached, or you're reading the Scriptures, or someone is explaining this to you, and then in that moment, the Spirit of God applies those things to your heart. Boom! It's like it's like there's a dark room, and uh, the Spirit of God goes and turns on the light switch. He takes the, the finger and uh, lifts that switch to the on position. Boom! There's lights on in the room. There was dark before. Now there's light in the room, and all of a sudden... You say, my goodness, I can see, I, I oh, the, the gospel is what I need. I'm a sinner. I, I'm in need of a savior. And so that's the first domino um, to, uh, I can show you John chapter 3. This is a commonly used to describe this. Jesus talks to Nicodemus um, and he says, Jesus answered, John 3, 3, 
Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Uh, and so what this is talking about is you must be born again in order to see the kingdom. You don't see the kingdom, evaluate it, and then become born again. You don't even see it unless you're born again. And so that what that is saying is um, there must be a, a spiritual awakening in you first in order to see the truth of the gospel to pursue after Christ. And so um, I think we can affirm that. I do. I believe that the Spirit of God has to work in somebody's heart before before they're going to be saved. Um, and, I, and I think that nobody wants to be saved apart from a prior work of the Spirit of God. So I can affirm that. And point four, I think we can agree on, all whom God draws to himself will be saved. All whom God draws will be saved. Um, let's look at John 6.44 for this one. John 6.44, Jesus is talking to a crowd and he says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. So what does that mean? It means Jesus is saying, no one comes to me, Jesus, no one comes to me, unless there is a drawing that happens by God himself. So God has to draw it. By the way, that draw word in Greek is very forceful. Uh, it's, it's not a gentle wooing, it is a, uh, it is a pulling. And so no one comes to me unless the Father draws him. You must be drawn by the Father to come. Uh, no one comes to God kicking and screaming. And nobody comes to God unless they, unless they want to come to God. So both of those things are true. Uh, but uh, Jesus says you'll be drawn to me. And all those who are drawn, verse 44, will be raised on the last day. Anyone whom God draws to himself will be saved. So God does not draw someone to himself and then they are uh, somehow outside of the kingdom of God. or uh, that, that just isn't possible because Jesus says, anyone whom God draws to me will be raised up on the last day. Um, so I think we can affirm that. That's sort of that irresistible grace category. Um, and then number five, our salvation is secure. Our salvation is secure. Uh, I know most Baptists already believe this. So even if you would say, I'm not a Calvinist, uh, you, do, you do hold one of the points of Calvinism, which is that salvation is secure, otherwise known as once saved, always saved. Look with me to Ephesians 1.13. By the way, I think this is the strongest verse in the whole Bible on the, the seal of our salvation. Uh, Ephesians 1.13. In him... In God, you, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So, when you heard the word of truth, you heard the gospel, you believed in him, instantly there was a seal placed upon your heart by the Holy Spirit of God. The Spirit of God keeps you saved. So, the Spirit of God awakens you to a new birth. He allows you to see clearly and to follow after Christ. And then he keeps you. So the Spirit brings you in and he keeps you in. I think that's a remarkably consistent way to think about the role of the Spirit in our salvation. And so it is, a, it is sort of a Calvinist point to say that all those uh, who are saved will be saved because God has the control to make it so. You can't choose your way out of salvation. If you are truly saved, you will die saved. You will persevere in the faith. Um, and, and so the opposite Arminian point is that, obviously, that you can lose your salvation. That is an Arminian principle, that you can lose your salvation um, because it's really up to you. It's your free will. You can choose it. You can lose it. It's up to you. Uh, and so I would, I would deny that that is true, that Arminian point is true, and affirm that our salvation is, in fact, secure. So taking all of those things, um, I, th I think one thing that I would say before I kind of get to my conclusion is that you might hear that and think, well, if God is in so much in charge, then w where does the witnessing come in? Uh, and that's actually one of the, one of the most consistent um, attacks against Calvinists is that, well, there's no need to witness 
if you, there's no need to share the gospel if someone's just going to, if God's going to do the work anyway. And I, just so you know, no actual Calvinist thinks that. That's a complete uh, slander uh, because I've been on the mission field with people and I've been church planting with people and I've seen an over-representation of people holding to Calvinist theology out doing work in mission, in mission work, difficult places, going to share the gospel openly, open air preaching. I mean, I've seen it. I've seen it from people that hold to uh, the doctrines of grace or Calvinism. So um, I would just say every Calvinist would say uh, you use this, uh, the word of God and the spirit of God accompanies the preached word or the scriptures and uh, he does that work, but our job, is, nonetheless, is to get that word out there as much as possible. Uh, you don't know who God's going to draw to himself. That's why I can stand up and preach to a crowd, a mixed crowd, every Sunday and say, any who want to come to Christ, come. Any. Drink from the, the water. The, the water's fine. Come on in. Uh, because at the end of the day, God's going to draw somebody. I'm not. My presentation is just part of it. Uh, I'm hopefully being faithful to the word. But the Spirit of God's got to draw somebody in, and it's not going to be me that does it, and So, which means that it's God that does it. So that actually gives me confidence in my preaching to say, man, just sling it. Sling the word out there and let God, let God draw in whom he's going to, going to draw. Uh, because if God truly has predestined, as Ephesians 1 says, uh, I don't know who those people are. I don't know who God's drawing to himself. I'm just a guy. I don't know anything. So I then have to preach the gospel to every breathing person and trust that God's going to do an incredible work in their lives. Uh, and when I hold that's true, I put my head on the pillow at night knowing that it's just up to me to share. It's not up to me to require results or to get down about if people don't respond. Again, that's not up to me. I just have to be faithful to sow the seeds and to share the gospel, uh, so I think that's pretty much where every Calvinist would 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 agree with that statement. Um, so, in conclusion, Baptists have historically tried to live somewhere in the middle. Calvinists uh, really saying that God is in control; God does it. Um, God initiates our salvation, um, and Arminians saying that it's really a free choice. Uh, God cannot know what your free decisions are. You are free. God does not um, override anything you think or do. He can't. It's your free will. You, you, that's, that's sort of, God is not really inside of your free decisions. Uh, and, and so if you're going to make me choose between those two things, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to click toward the Calvinist side because I just think, the scripture routinely presents God as being more in control than me and having control over, yes, even my thoughts and my will and my mind and my decisions. Um, so I'm going to go with the, the sovereign monarch of the universe being the king of my salvation. Uh, and again, that doesn't get me out of doing any work of the gospel. Um, and, and I would, and you know, one thing I've always said is I think more people are Calvinist than they want to, um, own up to, because we pray like we're Calvinists, don't we? When you when you sit down to pray, you probably pray something like this, Lord, would you open the hearts and the eyes of those who need to see your truth? Lord, would you save this person? And, you know, you don't want to, you don't pray, God, would you, as long as this person chooses you, choose them. We don't pray like that because you, in, you intuitively know that God has power and authority to change somebody's heart. You know that. And so, uh, again, that's why most Baptists historically have, have sided with the Calvinist side. Uh, where we are in history right now, most Baptists really don't want either title. And they try to live in the middle and just say, we, we're going to go with whatever the Bible says that day in front of us. We're going to preach that passage uh, and try to be and harmonize all these things. So... Um, if you made me choose, I would say, yeah, out of those two options of Calvinist and Arminian, sure, I'm a Calvinist. I, I don't have any problem choosing. I'll, I'll, I'll get on Team Spurgeon if I have to, if you make me choose. Uh, also, John MacArthur, a great pastor I listen to, is a, is a Calvinist. John Piper is a well-known 
uh, Calvinist David Platt, who was the president of the IMB a couple years ago, author, Calvinist. I mean, it, it's extremely more, more common than you might think. Um, and especially amongst young, young guys, there's kind of been a wave that's gone through. Um, but there are so many definitions and caveats. I don't openly go around uh, sharing that because most people don't know uh, what those words mean. They don't give you the benefit of the doubt of a discussion and explaining your position. Um, and people also don't know me. They don't know, you know that I have gone to overseas mission trips and, and I regularly pray for and think about and, and are burdened by unreached peoples in India because uh, they're not going to hear the gospel and they're not going to be saved if if we don't go. Uh, and so, yes, a Calvinist can say that uh, we we are we are still absolutely responsible for getting the gospel out there, though we believe that God's got to do the work. Uh, so, uh, I hope that answers some questions for you. You don't have to be you don't have to be exactly where I am on this. This is one of those things that it's, Christians debate about for years and years. Um, so, uh, is anything about Calvinism true? Yeah, a lot about it's true. I, I would actually say most things about it are true. Um, so hopefully that helps you a little bit, maybe sparks some interest in you. Please come to me with questions or discussion if you have any. Other than that, have a wonderful day. God bless.